be our live sir greetings to everyone present my name is ankit malhotra i am the co-founder and president of the jindal society of international law the society is a student led initiative formed under the aegis for the center for the study of united nations under the expert guidance and tutelage of professor dr westman popowski the inaugural address of this society was given on the 18th day of november in 2020 by the herbert and rose rubin professor of international law professor jose enrique alvarez of new york university along with the vice chancellor of our respected university professor dr siraj kumar and a very dear friend of the society and center professor dr mohan kumar the purpose of the society is to increase the student engagement and interaction with international law and the various subject matters that it has under its vast ambit rather than us being primarily research driven we intend to offer a host of opportunities contributing towards skill building and an overall interest in international law and studying persons who inspire us and the entire gambit of international law and lawyers and today we remember someone who we've lost an icon a stalwart and dare i say a gentle giant in himself this is none other than judge antonio augusto enchado trindade and to pay homage and respect to him we have a galaxy of persons not only work he has inspired but also their lives and their entire thought process i should not take much more time and invite our first speaker to share her her perspective and how judge has inspired him that has inspired her in her work and in her life uh, ma'am floor is yours well thank you very much um, ankit for the floor and the opportunity to say some words um, today um my name is monica feria tinta i am a practicing barrister at the bar of england and wales um with a specialization in public international law and a scholar um, a visiting fellow at Jesus College University of Cambridge. Um, I'd like to start by saying the following. Um, quite a lot has been said about the progressive approach of um, Judge Kansal Trindade to international law. But I'd like to make as a first point um, the fact that uh, his approach was that of a generalist. And in particular, um, uh, it was a rigorous approach to international law as a generalist. Um, and I like to emphasize this uh, going back to um, his um, PhD studies at the University of Cambridge, which focus on the application of the uh, rule of exhaustion domestic remedies. Uh, a book that I actually uh, uh, managed to find in the library of Cambridge and which um, gave me great uh, pleasure looking at uh, what uh, the young consultant daddy had said uh, about uh, international law and access to international justice uh, back in 1978. Now, Judge Burgenthal um, told me uh, once um, at the time that I was based at the International Court of Justice, um, he said that uh, he had taught a course in Strasbourg. This is the famous course that many of you may have attended uh, in the past on international human rights law. Um, and uh, uh, Professor uh, 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 Judge Burgenthal said that um, Judge Consult Trindade, back then a student, um, attended the course um, and um, took the examination. Now, the examination was uh, uh, um, le leading to a diploma. And the diploma, in fact, was supposed to be given just in a very selective manner to the best of the best. Um, and uh, Judge Burgenthal had been told to give that to, you know, very rarely. But when he was uh, faced with Judge Consal Trindade, um, he, he said, you know, I have to give this to him. He knows more international law than I do. And that, that uh, small anecdote was for me uh, quite uh, uh, said in that uh, uh, candid way by, by Judge Burgenthal back in 2000, uh, when, when I had the opportunity to meet him at the ICJ, was in a way depicting quite well uh, this um, uh, serious approach uh, of uh, uh, consulting that to the national law, this rigorous approach that he, that he had. So I like to make, in, in, from my perspective, perhaps um, uh, pick up eight points that I think are um, where I see um, a, a, a contribution um, 
to the law on the part of um, Antonio Cansal Trindade. First of all, picking up the point of the exhaustion of domestic remedies, I think this is quite a crucial point uh, going back to the moment where the inter-American system was defining its position concerning the theory of a state responsibility itself reflected in its jurisprudence. Um, this happened just uh, at the time that uh, um, James Crawford had completed his work um, draft, uh, on the draft articles on state responsibility. I had the opportunity back then, we are talking about the 2000s, uh, in particular the year 2002, um, I had the opportunity to represent a case, the case Gomez Pacquiao before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the ju judge Cansal Trindade was in the bench. Um, it arose an issue within the litigation uh, whereby the Inter-American Commission argued and back then, I, I, I may uh, remind to those who are not familiar with the inter-American system, only the commission uh, could bring cases before the court. And it was just the beginning of uh, the victims actually having standing before the court, but couldn't initiate a, a process. So uh, the uh, inter-American commission actually said that uh, in what pertained to the inter-American system, the rules on the state responsibility had a, a, a different approach to, to, to a state responsibility. And that was an interesting point that um, I disagree with. Um, and this was because um, certainly general international law was universal and it was not actually um, uh, meant to be divided into regional uh, kind of rules. Um, the effects in the particular case were major, but the purity of, of actually the principle and to get the, the laws right um, as a matter of, of, of jurisprudence or jurisprudential development, in my opinion, was quite crucial. So I, um, uh, I managed to get um, uh, uh, James Crawford to accept to be a uh, amicus curiae in the case. And he agreed with the position that I was advancing as representative of the victims denying that in fact there was such a regional rules of a state responsibility and upholding that actually the rules were the ones reflected in the draft articles. And this meant that for us it was quite important. What it was important was to understand at what point a state own um, a secondary, uh, uh, if you want, uh, effects or the secondary rules came to effect and at what point a state had committed a wrongful act. Um, and uh, this was important for the, for the reparations that came. Um, and we, we actually uh, agreed that uh, the wrongful extrajudicial execution of two minors was in itself a wrongful act. It didn't matter what uh, the state had done in terms of trying to redress that domestically, the wrongful act didn't have, didn't, didn't, it was not extinguished by the fact that some level of um, um, investigations had taken place at the time. And this meant in reparations uh, uh, awards that the victims were compensated for the wrongful um, extrajudicial execution and not just for the lack of due process. So that's one important example of, of uh, and I think a major, a major moment where, where, where the inter-American system was aligning itself, I would say, with what's happening in other courts around the world when it came to the rules of state responsibility. Second, I like to um, um, emphasize a, a, a topic that Professor Cans uh, Josh Cansal Trinidad was particular, particularly fond of, and that was the access of individuals to international justice. And on this, uh, procedurally speaking, um, this already started um, uh, on a number of um, separate uh, opinions that he delivered, but at the procedural practical level, um, it, it started with the, with the court having a different set of rules in 2001. And why am I saying this? This was because um, the Inter-American Commission took on a couple of cases the, the uh, position that the assessment of the law and the assessment of the facts um, in a case had to be the ones that the commission presented and couldn't be different. Now, this, um, as, as a litigator and as a representative of victims, I uh, didn't agree with um, and advanced a different assessment of the law 
and this different assessment of facts in cases I represented. So this created a, 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 a mini dispute within our dispute, um, the commission not agreeing with this. And the court then took a position on that. Um, and it was um, asserted uh, that individuals in the inter-American system were the, the real parties in the case before a court uh, and not the commission who really uh, comply with a different role. So the victims had actually full uh, right to have a different assessment of the law and to state uh, uh, the facts also in the manner they felt best. This happened in the gomez Pacquiao case as well. Um, and uh, it was an important precedent. After uh, this case, it, uh, there was never again a dispute as to that. The effects were major, and I will come back to this on a different point. So we can see there that all this um, position of uh, Judge Kansal Trindade on, on, on the right to, to the law, on the access of individuals to international justice and, and have their voice being heard before the courts uh, comes from these practical examples where he, as a judge, was engaged with, with imparting justice and interpreting the rules, interpreting the inter-American um, uh, uh, instruments uh, in align with that, with that vision. Third, uh, it, there's, a, there's a, a major contribution on substance, and this has uh, to do with the unity of international law uh, and with a point that, the that at the time was still contentious. Maybe I can see in the audience here, uh, in the speakers, uh, different generations. I'm certainly um, a closer to the generation of uh, uh, Judge Kansal Trindade, and I can tell you that back then, um, uh, the proliferation of different areas of international law posed the challenge that um, certain areas didn't communicate with the other. Um, but this inter-American system and in its position of judge uh, uh, Augusto Cansado Trindade, who actually there to see areas that in other systems and in other contexts people believe didn't communicate as actually being uh, fulfilling a role uh, that protected sometimes the same a juridical right, the juridical uh, uh, interest. For example, in the hermeneutics of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. So it was the inter-American system, one of the first systems in actually advancing that view of international law against the fragmentation of it. An example of this was um, the fact that in many of the cases that reached the court, um, um, the, uh, it was a necessity to actually apply the American Convention of Human Rights to uh, situations of violations of human rights in times of conflict. So we had conflict across Latin America in, in a number of, of uh, places, um, uh, in Peru, in, in Guatemala, in Colombia, the Colombian cases, the massacres that were brought before the court, all of them had taken place in the context of armed conflict. So that was the challenge that the inter-American system had. Um, and the jurisprudential developments in that sense very much um, uh, influenced uh, by the visions of those uh, sat in the sitting in the bench at the time, uh, including Augusto Cansado Trindade. That was a major, I would say, development in our, in, our, in our region, which has had repercussions all around the world. Um, I can tell you that today that, is, that has been uh, mainstreamed. Um, fourth, I would say that um, the very notion of um, certain types of violations of inter primary rules uh, amounting to serious violations of international law on the part of, of, a, of a states occupy the mind of Augusto Cansado Trinidad very much. Um, when I was counsel um, uh, on the Castro Castro uh, massacre case, um, I was asked important questions by him on uh, issues concerning state responsibility and crimes of the state. Um, what is important from this is the notion of aggravated state responsibility, which was acknowledged in a number of um, cases that uh, were, um, 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 it was found that uh, crimes against humanity, for example, had taken place. And why am I uh, emphasizing this in, in the Castro Castro, uh, prison case, um, I think that what is interesting is also the sophistication that eventually the American system reached. I mean, from a case like the, um, um, from certain cases where 
state responsibility was uh, was argued in a very nebulous manner uh, to a very very I would say sophisticated evidentiary uh, um, uh, techniques to actually prove uh, and show chain of commands uh, in the case of, Cast of the Castro Castro case. I mean, there's a big gap. So like if in cases like the Barrio Saltos case, um, chain of commands were not followed, but it was all established in a more general way. Uh, we advanced a lot in terms of establishing the chain of command. And that led to a specific result, which was, for example, to um, have as legal consequences um, the um, identification of specific, um, uh, I would say, uh, state actors uh, within uh, the, the different strata of uh, the security system within the state, and even uh, focusing the responsibility on those who had ordered the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity, um, including uh, 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 the need to investigate uh, um, the um, former head of the state uh, in, at that time, uh, in that particular case, um, Alberto Fujimori Fujimori. That is the first instance and the only instance to my knowledge where uh, International Human Rights Court um, has um, acknowledged uh, the um, um, as a legal consequence to a violation of a primary rule, the need to investigate, uh, to punish, uh, uh, if found guilty, a former head of a state. Five, engendering um, international law. Up to the moment, uh, and we are talking here 2006, up to 2006, the inter-American system have followed more or less a very neutral way to um, interpret the provisions of the American Convention. Um, when I pleaded the case, um, I um, arrived to the, to the view that um, this was essentially a case of uh, gender justice uh, because uh, the women victims, who, who, there was a, a group of women and a group of men um, had been subjected to a number of violations, including rape, which uh, uh, were central to the claim. Uh, the commission had not covered that uh, aspect of the claim and the commission had not raised um, any violations in that sense. So up to the point that the case arrived to the court, um, in terms of the assessment of the law and assessment of the facts, um, the gender aspects of the case had gone unnoticed. So it is uh, at that point that the court had to take a view, had to make, had to make a major decision. Number one, applying the rule obviously as well that, that we were allowed to present a assessment of, of the law and the facts in our own right, in the way we best thought. Um, but also uh, um, the fact that uh, um, violations uh, of um, um, conventions that had not been pleaded before uh, were accepted uh, during the proceedings as actually uh, arguable uh, in front of the court. Uh, it is at this point, uh, obviously, I, I, I um, pleaded the full range of violations, including for the first time, the violation of the convention de Beledo Para, uh, and invited the court to actually have a um, uh, understanding of the convention and of the dignity of the person in a way that recognized the the, the distinct dignity that uh, women, qua women had, and also obviously um, the manner how the gender of the victims were used uh, when states uh, violated uh, specific rights, uh, for example, within the provision of torture. Consulting Dade accepted this as the bench did, as uh, Cecilia Medina was also sitting at the time in, in the bench, the, the Chilean jurist. And I think, and, and they asked me many questions during the hearing, I think that was a turning point for the inter-American system. It was a moment where the rights of women became visible as such, and justice started becoming more even because up to that moment, rape had never been acknowledged as a violation of human rights in the inter-American system. In a, in a country, in a region where we had basically monist systems, that was crucial for the, uh, once the jurisprudence was created at that level, it had a major impact on all the domestic systems. Um, next, I would say uh, as a seventh, a seventh point that um, 
Cancel Trindade had a major contribution on what is our standing of due process, including on an aspect that went beyond what, what anyone could have conceived as part of the inter-American system. And I'm talking here about the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Uh, back then, uh, this was a convention that was understood only as um, uh, establishing relations between states. For the first time, Article 36 was uh, one was interpreted in a different light as containing individual rights and as containing a fundamental aspect of due process in certain contexts. Um, the uh, inter-American system delivered an advisory opinion of this, and that advisory opinion had a major effect on the understanding of the International Court of Justice. At the time, Germany was um, at the time that the advisory opinion was delivered, Germany was uh, suing the United States for a major case concerning um, this uh, a, a specific treaty. And I had a, a small role to actually advise a, a counsel for Germany, Professor Bruno Zima, on um, these um, findings and this way of understanding the, the Vienna Convention of Consular Rights, which the uh, um, uh, German position um, took up and argued in front of the court, and which we know won before uh, in the International Court of Justice against the, uh, against the United States. And that's again the vision that the inter-American system was bringing to uh, uh, and was being mainstreamed in, in, in international uh, law in its jurisprudence. Finally, uh, indigenous people's rights um, are a, a major area of contributions of uh, um, Judge Cansao Trindade. Um, here, uh, probably uh, many of you are going to say uh, 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 more, and so I'm not going to go into any depth into that, but I'd just like to say that one of the important uh, notions that come from uh, various uh, decisions that were taken um, to that effect is the, the fact that uh, the notion of um, um, the right to a, a, a life in dignity, uh, I would rescue that. Uh, in particular, why? Because today that very notion has been brought in a diff to a different context, particularly in environmental litigation. And I can say that that was one of important um, notions that I um, brought uh, before um, uh, the Human Rights Committee recently in the first international case on climate change against Australia uh, on behalf of First Nations, uh, the Torres Strait Islanders case. Um, and this is the only notion that actually allows us to give um, uh, effectivity to some basic economic and social rights within the notion of the right to life, the right uh, to humane treatment, and I'd say um, uh, uh, within that, the, the right to dignity. All of these, uh, I think, uh, uh, have been developing from a very rigorous approach to international law. And this is what I what I rescue from, from Cansao Trindade. Reparations, and with this I finish, uh, it has been also uh, finally an area where he had made major contributions. I met him lastly um, in, in The Hague um, uh, when uh, the case concerning um, um, Chile and Bolivia was being uh, heard. Uh, in our last conversation, he, uh, mm, gave me uh, as a gift his, um, um, a, a copy of his Hague Academy um, uh, course, which had been just printed. And something that he said was, watch for this case coming to the um, International Court of Justice. Now we are going to decide the reparations case. Um, and it was the first time that the court was going to decide on, on reparation concerning an interstate complaint. Uh, he, uh, uh, it was not to be that he was going to be sitting in that bench. Um, uh, but I, I, I remember that he, when I asked him about his separate opinions, he said, uh, and with great pride, that he had uh, left those uh, separate opinions for the future, for, 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 for what we come next, and, and, and for us, uh, and to, to, to find some reason uh, behind this, uh, this um, I would say, uh, reasoning of him. Um, so that maybe in the past it will be picked up and, and, and may become mainstream. And he, he told me that he had written each of these separate opinions in different islands, something that I found quite, uh, quite sweet, but it showed also this, uh, this focus and this, this uh, complete, uh, uh, I would say, um, 
giving himself totally to, to a particular subject at the time he was um, busy with in, in, in this uh, task of imparting international justice. We have had in him a major exponent of international law, this in the words of many of us, certainly, and I hope that uh, the next generations will understand, and not only the Latin American generations for whom I think the system has been changed for good, but I believe that uh, beyond Latin America, we are having already the effects of his thinking uh, in many jurisprudential developments, um, and that's what we have to be grateful for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll now invite Professor Paula to share her address, please. Thank you, Ankit, for organizing this event, commemorating Cansado Trindade in the name of the Gendal Society of International Law, and thank you also for having me here. I'm Paula Wojciechiewicz Almeida. I'm full professor of international law at the master's and uh, PhD programs at the Getulio Vargas Foundation Law School. I'm also visiting professor at other universities in Europe, namely the University of Salzburg. I did my PhD in France at the Ecole Doctorale du Droit International Européen de, de, de Paris, the Sorbonne. So it is with great honor to be able to share a few words and memories on the profound impact that my dear mentor, my dear friend, brilliant professor and judge, Antonio Cansado Trindade, had on my academic life and also in the development of international law. I am particularly pleased uh, to be sharing this panel with uh, dear colleagues and friends from Brazil and other parts of the world uh, all united together to commemorate Cansado Trindade. We met uh, with Cansado in person uh, right after he served as a president at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2005, when he delivered his enlightening general, general course on international law for humankind towards a new use gentium at the Hague Academy of International Law. I was doing at the time my master's degree in Paris at this, uh, this precise moment. Later on, we had, uh, I had the opportunity to attend three international law courses chaired by the Organization of American States in 2006, 2007, and 2009 as a PhD student. And the general course was always taught by Cansado Trindade. After he took uh, office as a judge at the ICJ, we could still regularly meet at least once a year when he would come to Rio uh, to give his lecture at the Organization of American States course. His talk uh, was very much awaited and we were all among students and professors willing to hear his charismatic voice, his valuable experience, and his critical thoughts modulated by seriousness and by humor. The keys were very long uh, for book autographs. Um, uh, all uh, interested scholars were uh, waiting with patience because, they, because it was always worth it. Words that could change one's life, words were carefully chosen by Cansado Trindade because he knew the positive influence he could exercise in our minds as young researchers. He believed in the new generation, as he always said proudly. Professor Cansado Trindade played an essential role in my decision to become an international law scholar. He would closely follow my academic path, giving precious advice and crucial, crucial guidance. He would always say, I quote, do not be superficial, focus on a substantial contribution to international law, think critically and do not follow the mainstream doctrine if your conscience points you to another direction. He believed in international law. He believed in recta ratio. We have to be critical and think about the progressive development of international law, he insisted. And we can make a difference. And he made a difference, not only because he was a great international law scholar, besides being an international judge, but also because he was a great and generous person. Judge Cansado Trindade never stopped critically thinking international law. During his vacations, he would write and reflect about international law, which led to several dissenting votes at The Hague. Although he was very busy, he would always find some time for inspiring the so-called new generation. I had the honor to have him as a member of my PhD jury at Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne in 2012. 
Later on, after being qualified as full professor of international law, I brought my students to The Hague and he warmly received them at the Peace Palace, presented his office and spent a great deal of time discussing about his role as a judge at the ICJ. Since then, uh, we kept having frequent and fruitful exchanges in which he would present latent discussions deriving from cases being heard at the ICJ. He instigated me to write analytical papers on diverse international law topics, such as the immunities case between Germany and Italy and on the migrant workers as a result of my participation in the Center for Studies and Research in International Law and International Relations at the Hague Academy of International Law, among others. We have uh, constantly had uh, rich experiences, uh, rich exchanges, let me say, and I'm already missing them. Brazil tends to be an autistic country, as he would criticize, and we have to fight for the realization of justice. Casado warned, the universities, not only in Brazil, but also in many other countries, are today infected with positivists and realists, which explains the worrying decline in the cultivation of legal and social science. He was really an extremely worried about this. He chose his battles, and his battles were really hard. But he would not deny his own conviction, even when it was costly before his conservative colleagues. In his dissenting opinion on the nuclear arms race case in 2016, he reiterated his entire disagreement with the judgment. Fidel a ses propres convictions, he said, and I quote, I distance myself as much as I can from the position of the court's majority so as to remain in peace with my conscience. His general course in 2005 at the Hague Academy of International Law on International Law for Humankind reflected his legal conscience. It was the first general course on public international law ever taught by a Brazilian jurist since the foundation of the Hague Academy of International Law in 1923. Following the publication of his general course uh, in the collection of the Riquet de Cour de l'Académie de Droit International de la Haye, published by Martinez Nishot Publishers, he intended to have it circulated in Brazil. He invited me to write his book Reveal in Brazilian Portuguese, which was published in 2013 uh, by the Getúlio Vargas Foundation Law School. The book was the result of personal reflections he accumulated over a lifetime dedicated to the theory and practice of international law. The late motive of his work, as it was already mentioned by Monica, is the observation that international law is a corpus juris oriented towards achieving the needs and aspiration of human beings and humanity in general. Casado warned, and I quote, this is not a manual of international law, but a critical work that transcends positive law. Cansado was concerned with uh, restoring values at a time of evident crisis and neglect. Cansado denounces the classical, the classic positivist doctrine and maintains that individuals are unquestionably subjects of rights and obligations that emanate directly from international law. They are the primary addressees of international legal norms. The right of access to justice constitutes for Cansado Trindade, the most important legacy of, of the international legal thought of the second half of the 20th century. He seeks to construct an international law for humankind, for humanity, the new use gentium based on ongoing conceptual constructions that reaffirm its universal character. And for this, he rescues basic considerations of humanity, which are indispensable in the current moment, which is marked by a profound crisis of values. And he argues that these considerations are already found in the corpus juris of contemporary international law. He also recalls the ancient ideal of compulsory jurisdiction as a manifestation of the international community's search for the realization of justice at the international level. Cansado Trindade announces, and I quote, the time has come to overcome definitely the regrettable lack of automatism in inter of the international jurisdiction. In the same vein, he stressed uh, the positive character of the multiplicity of international courts in contemporary international law, together with the process of decentralization of 
of the international legal order beyond the purely interstate perspective. For Cansado Trindade, the jurisdictional function is guided above all by the ideal of achieving justice. An international court cannot remain indifferent to human suffering. La raison d'état cannot be used as an excuse to deny justice to individuals, he insisted. The passion for international law and the zeal with the readers and disciples shine through and permeate his entire work, which makes it really sensitively humanized. There is reason for hope and confidence in the future of international law, assures Cansado Trindade in his epilogue. He concludes by demonstrating a profound feeling of confidence in the new generation of international jurists for the construction of the new Jews gentium for the new century. As Latin Americans and Brazilians, we are proud to have had among us professor and judge Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade. There can be no better tribute to Cansado Trindade as an academic than to look off all the people he has inspired some of them are also taking part in this webinar. The ICJ lost a progressive and a brilliant judge. Scholars lost a humanized and thought-provoking discussions. And I lost a brilliant mentor and a dear friend. I'm already missing our enriching conversations. To conclude my brief remarks, there is one of the lessons I will always remember. We should always remain faithful to our conscience. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to share these thoughts. Thank you again, Ankit. Thank you. Uh, let me now invite Professor Pablo to share his address to this August gathering, please. Good evening. It is good evening now in India, but it's actually good morning in Brazil. Therefore, hello. I am Paulo Emilio Vautier Borges de Macedo, and I am a professor of international law at the University of Rio de Janeiro, a visiting scholar at the Murdoch University and Krakow University. The judge and the professor Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade exerted an immense influence over an entire generation of Brazilian international lawyers, my generation. Thence, it is a hard task to do justice to such a great man. Better women and men than myself have spoken and will still talk about his influence on the international law of human rights, on his pivotal role at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and on his courage at the International Court of Justice. So in my speech, I would like to unveil some lesser known traits of his character as well of his thoughts that were significant to my own journey. First, Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade was an idealist. Now, this can be tricky given the polysemic nature of this word. He most certainly was not a dreamer or a naive individual, nor the ideas he propounded were utopic or his confidence in human rights and international law misplaced whatsoever. Yet, he wasn't an idealist in a sense that he was a man of principles. Professor Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade was no different from the judge. He practiced that which he believed. It should not be so, but this is rather uncommon among Brazilian intellectuals that, also, that are also a magistrate or hold a public office. One famous Brazilian intellectual went as far to ask the nation, and I quote, to forget what I have written. Indubitably, an intellectual can mature, but his works on, uh, I'm sorry, but his works on the 1980s did not substantially differ from those of the 2000s. He matured, he matured like a good wine. He just became better with, with time. Moreover, Antonio Guscansa Trindade was an idealist also in the sense that he believed ideas, mainly a good idea such as justice, preceded physical reality. We became so accustomed to a materialistic philosophical view that this might surprise some. The world that one sees and touches is not really all there is. For instance, 
Numbers and, mathemat and mathematics in general are not material entities, but they are still real. The great mathematician Roger Penrose, who worked alongside Stephen, Stephen Hawking, even stated that mathematical truths were discovered, not constructed by human reasoning. If numbers possess some kind of reality, so does, so does justice, human rights, etc. We all know that Antonio Augusto Cansado de Trindade was very critical to positivism, but what does that imply? Well, I met him in 2005 when he was delivering the general course of international law at the Hague. I was already acquainted with his ideas from his books and his rulings at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And I was especially intrigued by the numerous quotations of Grotius and the scholastic Spaniards in his vote, such as in advisory opinion numbers 16 and 18. Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade not only reckoned natural law as the philosophical approach of the founding fathers of international law, but to international law today, he would speak of the rebirth or the eternal return of natural law, for instance, in advisor opinion number 17. And more bluntly, more bluntly, he would state in his vote in the Miguel Castro Castro prison case, and I quote, underlying the concept of use cogens is the natural law theory. Which, lead this, which leads to peremptory regulations based on the affirmation and enshrinement of ethical values that seek to benefit humanity as a whole. For him, justice, good, and truth are objectively real, not subjective feelings. And international law, as well as law in general, is in fact a means by which human beings can reduce evil in an imperfect world. In his vote in the case of Saho Yamasha indigenous community, he argued that, and I quote, but how can we explain the suffering of innocent children? How can we understand the fate of a child born on the roadside who fleetly passes through this life and then dies on the same roadside? More than an absurdity, it is a great injustice, a suffering caused by men to his fellow men. Great part of human suffering is caused by men. That was pointed out, for example, by C.S. Lewis in his study on the problem of pain, wherein he reminds us the views by Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas on the, importance of, on the importance of knowing the existence of evil in order to face it and not letting it take over. And later on, on his, the same vote, he would state, after transcribing the those words by Albert Camus, the above mentioned theo theologist, he was referring to H. Mama, added that one of the hardest problems facing human beings is the existence of evil. It's not an exclusively religious problem. Any feeling person is disturbed by evil and by pain. Strong words, but these are stronger and I'm quoting him from his vote in the Miguel Castro Castro prison. In his memories of the Spanish Civil War, George Orwell denounces the lies that led hundreds and hundreds of people to the armed struggle and death, and that immediately sought to dishonor the dead. Before the possibility of having so many lies go down in history, he confessed, the sensation that the concept itself of objective truth is disappearing from the, word, the world. He also confessed his fear before the purpose of the leaders in power of controlling not only the future, but also the past. This perspective, added George Orwell, scares me much more than the bombs. Let this sentence resound a little bit. Good, evil, and truth do exist. However, that which baffled me the most was his works on the Hatahash right reason as basis for international law. And consider how he would just slide this term in on several works focused on the international personality of individuals or on the sources of international law or even on the use of force in international law. Still, Antonio Buscansa Trindade would, would take things further. He would name his investiture speech at the Brazilian Academy of Juridical Letters a reta racha nos fundamentos do jurídico como direito internacional da, da humanidade, which is the reta racha in the foundations of the jurídico as international law of mankind. 
at the Hague, he then he developed the, such arguments in a more comprehensive framework, a true corpus juris. International law may stem from treaties and state practice, but it is, it is not created from these. Voluntarism, which is often associated to positivism, cannot account for discussions, the permanence of international obligations in state succession, the proper son of principle, and so forth. Even treaties are only a source of international obligations inasmuch as there exists a rule called pacta sum servanda. State will is an important agent, but not a principle of international law. In sum, international law is for human beings, not the other way around. At that time, I was writing a thesis on the concept of Eugentium in Francisco Suarez and Hugo Grotius. Hence, that course was most befitting. More than that, I realized that a smarter and more knowledgeable person than I was shared the same convictions. And this leads us to the second trait I would like to highlight, his intellectual generosity. Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade did not know me and certainly did not have to, but he was more than willing to converse with me. And most surprisingly, he welcomed my thoughts on the matter. Predictably, my supervisor and I invited him to take part on the examination board of my used doctor thesis, to which he graciously accepted. However generous, he was also a careful and demanding supervisor, examinator. He alone inquired me more than three hours. Despite that, he liked the thesis and would continue to extend his generosity. He invited me to write papers in two books he edited and wrote many a letter of a recommendation for my postdoctoral enterprises. Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade influenced not only my thoughts, but my career as well. Godspeed, Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade. Thank you. That was a very heartfelt address. Uh, I'll now like to invite Aline to share her thoughts, please. I, we can't hear you. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Aline Rivera Maldonado. Uh, I'm a Mexican lawyer, a specialist in human rights, law, and gender. And I'm a PhD candidate at the Center for Research and Studies on Fundamental Rights at the University of Paris Nanterre in France. Uh, my PhD research focuses on the international protection of women's human rights against poverty and intersectional discrimination. Uh, my contribution will be a little be, bit more sentimental, I think. Um, first of all, I would like to thank my colleagues, Ankil Malhotra and Mariana Nodales, for the invitation and also the Gender Society of International Law for bringing us together today. It is my honor and privilege to participate in such important and especially emotional event in the memory of the Judge Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade, who was and will be for me and for many other disciples and colleagues, not only an eminent intellectual and mentor, but above all, one of the biggest humanists of this century, who spent his life defending human rights and dignity, and more recently, promoting the protection of the planet. I had the great fortune to meet uh, Judge Kansal Trindade in The Hague in 2014, uh, that year, I joined the Center for Studies and Research of the Hague Academy of International Law, focusing at the time on the rights of women and the elimination of discrimination. The French research team was led by Professor Hélène Tigusda, who encouraged me to present my work on the protection of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable women to the Judge Cansado. After multiple cordial and warm exchanges uh, by email, the judge welcomed me 
at the International Peace Palace in the Hague. Uh, also, uh, we had never met before. The judge acted in a very friendly way and in prior to our meeting, he invited me to share the lunchtime with other judges of the International Court of Justice and some other researchers and PhD students in the restaurant of the PH, uh, of the Peace Palace, sorry. I quickly noticed that Professor Cansado was very respectful of his colleagues, no matter their, their status, nationality, age of, or experience. I wanted to share with all of you this personal and particular memory because the attitude of the Professor Cansado marked me deeply, not just as a person, but also as a scholar and as a lawyer. Indeed, from the beginning of, uh, to the end of my visit at the International Court, the judge always treated me as his equal, as his colleague, as, he, as, we, were, as we were two long-time friends. This feeling and conf of confidence allowed me to freely express and discuss my work, opinions and arguments with the judge, and I completely forgot the existing hierarchy of different or different statues between us. Therefore, we, we spend the evening rethinking the world and the international human rights law future. I would like to emphasize that because in contrast, my other professional experiences in the field of human rights, particularly in France, as a Mexican lawyer and PhD student, were absolutely shaped, unfortunately, by a sense of hierarchy and a kind of culture of constant struggle and competition to be better than anybody else. A culture that, in my view, fully embraced the categorization of people according to, to their position in the university, their credentials, their origin, etc., etc. I think that this culture can be harmful to the people considered at the bottom of the professional pyramid, and especially those that beginning for, of their careers, at the beginning of their careers, sorry. That is why my meeting with the Professor Cansado was extraordinary for me, because as well as discussing as peers the world human rights situation, we also, he also took the time to strongly encourage me to stand up for my ideas and not to give up in the face of academic and personal obstacles. He also motivated me to continue my commitment to the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people and to fight, er, fight every day to try to make this world a better place for all, a world in which human rights are not a privilege a world in which a dignified life is not reserved for a few select people. This was the spirit and the vision of the Professor Cansado in theory and in practice, and I'm firmly convinced that this, this will be also his legacy. His tireless work to humanize the rights, the international courts, and the law itself are for me an invaluable example of how the legal standards and doctrines can and should be used as a shield of protection for the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people, as well as a weapon to fight poverty, inequality, and injustice. The judge consulting Dade shows us with arguments and evidence that international law can be an instrument to make this world a better world for present and future generations. Today, more than ever, this world needs jurists, lawyers, and professors committed to this legacy of George Cansado. Today, more, more than ever, international law must be used not only to humanize our societies, but also to protect life, human and non-human, above all. 
In memory of the Judge Cansado, I invite all those who listen to us to echo, to propagate, and to perpetrate these ideas in all parts of the world, just as he did. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you for showing us the path toward dignity. We will strive every day to try to make this world a better place for life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for that illuminating address. Um, I'll now invite Professor Rafael to share his address, please. So good morning and good evening to, to everybody. Uh, I want to start thanking, I thank you Ankit for, for the invitation and the Jindal Society on International Law. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, I want to greet my, my colleagues and my friends, Paulo Emilio and Paula, uh, which were, are here in this morning, um, making this tribute to Cansado Trindade and my, new, my other colleagues that I am meeting today in this tribute. Uh, it's quite um, complicated, but easy. Uh, I don't have something new to tell you after hearing all uh, the colleagues before me, but I wanted to share my comments very, very briefly, very shortly on uh, Judge Cansado Trindade, on scholar Cansado Trindade. And I thought, I think that I, I, I want to, to share with you and I, I want to structure my comments in two paths. One of the paths is on his work, on how, what he represents to international law. And the other path is about his Cansado uh, Trindade uh, as a human being and what it means. Um, first of all, when we, on my comments on his work and on what he represents to international law, I want to stress something that Monica said in the, just quite in the beginning, that she said that he represented a, a very strong um, uh, a symbol of the unity of international law. And when I, I started my, my studies as an international lawyer, as an international law professor, uh, I, am, I am a chair of international, public international law at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and I have PhD in public international law and also in, in private international law. Uh, the, when we, Cansado Trindade permeates all the studies of international law. We can, we study Cansado Trindade when we talk about human rights. We study Cansado Trindade when we talk about uh, general public international law. We study Cansado Trindade and his uh, uh, um, uh, work and his uh, uh, theories when are, we are on conflict of laws, he permeates all uh, international law. But most of all, and I think that what is the most important uh, thing that he represents to international law and to the unit of international law is that he had the opportunity to work in two different courts, in two different systems, in systems that when before Cansado Trindade, we had an, uh, quite an opinion that those uh, systems could not have a dialogue. They could not communicate uh, uh, between themselves. And Cansado uh, worked as a kind, somehow as a Trojan horse, but a nice one, not a bad one, introducing or making human rights uh, somehow a language that could also be used on the ICJ uh, strongly. Uh, uh, before him, I think that the, the whole structure of international law divided those uh, um, accords and those uh, uh, theories uh, in some way that uh, we couldn't, we, we could make a dialogue between them or among all theories, but after Cansado Trindade, it is clear uh, and it is allowed somehow. Uh, so first of all, I think that the, the, what he, he worked 
and his work and what he represents to international law is this work for the unity of international law. On the other hand, I want to, to, to tell you and to, to share with you some experiences that I had with the human being. When I and I, I, I was like uh, hearing you, and I could write down here some uh, adjectives and some, some um, uh, comment about his personality as he was friendly, he was generous, he was warm, he was polite, he was inspiring. And most of all, he was a very low profile. Uh, almost a humble uh, authority. One of the, the greatest authorities that we have on international law, and he was very, very low profile. And I had this experience uh, with him because when I was uh, general secretary of the permanent tribunal of Mercosur in Asuncion, Paraguay, uh, his son, which works on Brazilian foreign affairs, he was living in Paraguay, in Asuncion. And Cansado Trindade was used to visit his son there. And the first time his son called me and said, Rafael, uh, my father is here and he wants to visit the tribunal. He wants to, to, to make like a visit, a formal visit. And then he got there the first time and it was like very formal. We took pictures and for the, the, the social media of the tribunal and so on. But after this visit, the fir this first visit, Cansado started to come to the tribunal to use the library of the tribunal as a working place, as a place that he was like, uh, that he clearly could feel at home in Paraguay. Like he, he was there to visit his son and then he got to the tribunal to the library to, to, to share his moments with the books. And what we, we, we can, uh, uh, we keep in our memories, everybody that worked in the, in the tribunal, this very low profile, gentle, general, warm, polite, and inspiring human being that, uh, as Alini just said, that who, who, who could never... Uh, um, treat people uh, differently. He was very, 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 uh, a very kind man. And personally, I want to share with you uh, something that Paulo uh, stressed and Paula also stressed about his, um, uh, as a, 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 a man or a scholar that had his issues with legal positivism. Uh, after this contact that we had in Paraguay, I met Cansado Trindade, Judge Cansado Trindade, some opportunities after that. And he always started his small talk with me, asking me, hi, Rafael, how are you? Are you still on legal positivism? <laughs> this was his way to somehow to, to stress that maybe I, I was still an, a, a little bit immature and that I needed to, 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 to leave the legal positivism someday, somehow, finally. Uh, so I just want to say that if, if, um, the international law lost it has, I think that his work was not finished. He was in the middle of a great, great, great work, and it was a very early interruption. And maybe what I want to say finally here in this, in this uh, tribute to Cansado Trindade, that it is our, our uh, uh, mission to try to, to follow his paths and to, to finish his job, to finish, finish his work on the protection of human beings, human rights, and on the, 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 a new and different vision and approach to international law. And uh, as a last comment today, uh, I see here 
Paula, Paulo, and me representing the Brazilian uh, scholars uh, that uh, are of, of the nationality of, of uh, Cansado Trindade. But I see also here um, friends and colleagues of other Latin American countries uh, sharing their experiences uh, uh, with Cansado Trindade and their vision on Cansado Trindade. And I want to say that Cansado Trindade was not just uh, uh, representing uh, the Brazilian vision and approach to international law, but uh, very uh, uh, most the Latin American approach to international law. He was not just representing uh, our uh, cosmovision uh, but the, of Brazil, but uh, the, the, the way that Latin America uh, uh, thinks and uh, uh, understands international law. Uh, Ankit, very, thank you very, very much for the invitation. I thank the Gendal Society um, for the invitation. And uh, um, Cansado Trindade, we are here to uh, follow your, your paths and to, to continue with your job uh, to, on, on the, your approach to international law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, um, I'll now invite our final live speaker to share his address. Uh, Salvador, the floor is yours, please. Oh, thank you very much. You'll have to unmute, sorry. Sorry about that. Let's start again. So everybody, good morning or good evening in IST time. Uh, my name is Salvador Herencia Carrasco. I am Peruvian. Although I am Brazilian at heart because I lived for 10 years in Brazil. And uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Ankita, and, thank, and thanks to the Jindo Society of International Law for this organizing this symposium in memoriam of Judge Cansado Trindade. I knew that he was not well. And as Rafael sa said at the, at the end of his intervention, his work was not done. And in the case of Russia versus the Ukraine, this is the judge that we needed in the bench. And when he was not present there, we I think we all feared the worst because there was no way that he was going to miss such an important and landmark case for what it means for multilateralism, uh, the, the resolution of conflicts through peaceful means, among other issues. So I'm I'm also very sad to be part of of this of this symposium because but hopeful in the way that he might not he's no longer with us but i have no doubt that his work and his teachings will live forever like monica i am peruvian i'm a peruvian citizen although i am currently in canada i direct the human rights clinic at the university of ottawa and i also teach at the faculty de droit civil uh here here in ottawa and Cansado had a strong relationship with my country. So I would like to divide my presentation in two parts. One, explaining the impact that his leadership as president of the Inter-American Court had for the development of Inter-American human rights system as a whole. But secondly, some comments on his notion or his approach to the universal on universal conscience of humankind and what it means to me that you turn his understanding or theory on international law of humankind as in the symposium advertisement stated Kansal Trindaji was a judge from the court between 90, 1995 and 2006 and he was president between 1999 and 2003 and I think that this was a court that had a lot of synergy and they actually all of the judges propelled a significant advance of the case law of the inter-american court of human rights but by reading his concurring opinions you can see what i think monica paula and paulo were saying that he was writing for future generations 
that he was writing to try to change the status quo, that international law cannot just be what states determine what it is. His concept of opinio iuris communitatis, that is on the dissenting opinion of a case between Marshall, Island, between Marshall Islands and India, it's precisely that. Who makes the rules? Who benefits the rules? And what happens to the other 90% of those that do not participate in those rulemaking? So we are here with the Jindal Global University, which is one of the leading universities in third world approaches to international law. So I do not have to expand on the importance and significance of these questions. So as a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, I would just like to highlight three cases that for me are fundamental and relevant as they are today, including their, his concurring opinions. The first one is the case of street children versus Guatemala, Niños de la Calle. This is, this, all of these cases are available in English, if you're interested. So the American Convention of Human Rights always states in Article 26 that economic, social, and cultural rights are of progressive development, the classic 1960s human rights approach to treaties. But Niños de la Calle, Street Children, is the first case that it starts to bring the synergy between these two families, okay, or outdated families of human rights categories. His concurring opinion of only three pages long, he says that we cannot, we cannot continue to work on human rights as separate fields. What right to life do you have if you're living on the street as the street children were in this case? The issue of poverty, not as a social economic condition, but as a matter of rights, it's all there. And for those that are interested in political theology, these three pages is a summary of the, uh, liberation theology from Latin America, but also Latin American humanism at its best. Its impact influence and series of rulings until the landmark case of Lagos del Campo versus Peru in 2017, where the court decided that economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights are judicially enforceable under the American Convention of Human Rights. So what he started in 1999, 20 years later or 20 plus years later became a reality. But if you read this carefully, and again, three pages for Cansado Trindade's standards, Paulo, you know, this will be a tweet, right? In comparison to his dissenting opinions at the International Court of Justice. He talks about cultural, cultural knowledge, preservation, future generations, which is pretty much the blueprint of the Escasu Agreement on Environmental Justice. And all of that is in that concurring opinion. The second case that I would like to highlight is something that I think Monica mentioned briefly and also Aline on Aguastigni versus Nicaragua, indigenous rights. We may talk and celebrate ILO Convention 169 or the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of 2007, but without the case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, this would only be legal aspirations. The Inter-American Court, well, the system as a whole, but since we're talking of just on Cansado Trindade's work, his work and the work of the court propelled to give international, this international law of indigenous peoples, teeth, sustenance, justice, and accountability. In Aguastigni, again, in a very short tweet, short opinion, sorry, not tweet, opinion, he talks about the importance of international environmental law cultural knowledge, participation, this in 1990, in 2001. So although Cansado left the court before the, the real landmark cases of indigenous rights like Sarayaku, Saramaka, the blueprint of the protection of indigenous rights and, the, and how he justifies to move the Article 21 from, from, inter, from individual property to collective property and to protect the cultural and ancestral knowledge of indigenous peoples set the path to what we have today. And, and it's a case law that has not only influenced Latin American states, but 
this has been used by the African system of human rights. It has been used by the different UN offices to establish a binding legal set of obligations on states. And this all started under his leadership in, in 2001. The third case that I would like to highlight is Barrio Saltos versus Peru. Monica has also already mentioned some of this, some of the implications, although in Gomez Paquillauri and also Castro Castro. But to me, and if there's anybody that is not from Latin America, I invite you to read the Barrio Saltos versus Peru movie from 2001. To me, it is to this day the most important decision of the Inter-American Court in its history. And why is that? Because Latin America's transitional justice model from dictatorships to democracy was built from the Spanish model of 1978. And that Spanish model was pretty much to forgive and forget. Basically, lays, uh, amnesties, pardons. Okay, let's forget about this. Let's look towards the future. With Loaiza Tamayo and other cases that Monica knows even better than me, comes Barrio Saltos. In Barrio Saltos, we're talking about the case was decided in 2001, okay? But it came in the late 90s where Fujimori was still under government, where we had a paramilitary group uh, that was doing the shady operations, the executional, uh, 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 the extrajudicial executions, the forced disappearance and torture, and so all the things. Barrio Saltos says that self-amnesties are contrary to the American Convention of Human Rights. Paragraph 41. That paragraph pretty much opened a whole system and a whole, it broke down all the anti-terrorism legislations. It, it broke down all the impunity laws that were applied in Argentina, in Chile, in Uruguay, in Brazil, later in Brazil. And for me, and again, if you read Judge Cansado's concurring opinion, he actually complained, even though he was president, that his fellow judges gave him only a few hours to write his concurring opinion. Okay, But he says, in a simple way, out self-amnesties, we cannot look at self-amnesties any other way than this. Self-amnesties are a legal aberration. Now, in 2022, we take this, of course, there's no debate about this. But to say this in 1999, to say this in 2001, before the entry into force of the Roman statute. So if, if you look at this historically, if we look into this in a perspective of, the, of, of what, uh, what I think Paolo and Alina were talking about, writing for the future, this was his aspiration. So I think that these three votes, which are all available in English, uh, Anki, in a way reflect the impact that he has had on fight against impunity, indigenous peoples, and social justice. Since this is a, 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 a case, a, a symposium organized by an Indian university, I cannot state enough how important and relevant these topics are also for us, for, for, for people in the global South as a whole. To finalize, Ankit, I would like to also talk about a case of his dissenting opinion now as a judge at the International Court of Justice on the case of Marshall Islands versus India and the obligations concerning the negotiations relating to the cessation of nuclear arms race. It is a very long title, my apologies for that. But here he says something that is very, very important, that we can opinio juris, as we understand traditionally under international law, is incomplete because we need to th think about the opinion, opinion juris communis to bring different peoples, to bring different organizations to create this opinion juris. And for me, and with this, I, I will start to conclude, uh, I'll anchor it. It gives it lessons, leads me with three lessons. One, to avoid seeing international law as different boxes. When you separate international economic law from human rights, you're just benefiting those who are in power. And as and and this cannot be. This is how we end up with instead of business and human rights accountability mechanisms, this is how we end up with social responsibility. Because we look at them 
as different fields that do not necessarily connect or connect in a very limited limited manner. Secondly, Professor B.S. Chimney wrote a comment on this dissenting opinion of um, uh, of the of Judge Gonzalo Trindade, and for him, it was surprising and refreshing to see somebody having a critical approach to international law being a sitting judge at the ICJ. This also this raises an alarm that global South scholars, and this with all due respect to Professor Chimney, who I respect and I admire and cite his work all the time, it gives us a lesson of what are we as global South lawyers doing to support and collaborate among each other? Because notions of international law of humankind or the universal juridical conscience of humankind, this is not new. He wrote this in his doctoral thesis in Oxford in the early 70s. Right? And if you've read his work as a judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, for us, I mean, I see Paulo nodding. This is nothing new for us. He just brings it to new lights under different circumstances. So this is like a call to see how, as Global South scholars, whether you're a twail, a critical racial theory, feminist, we can use this work right, to collaborate among each other and to try to make this opinio iuris communis uh, as uh, something for all of us to work on. And my final, my final word, my final saying is we need to see Gonzalo's work as a floor and not the ceiling. If we are true to what everybody, Rafael and Lalini have also said, have talked about this a lot, in the way that he was writing for the future, he was thinking about victims, he was thinking about reparations, he was thinking about gender justice, social justice, then this should be the starting point, especially from us in Global South, to start working together and to expand these notions to really make true what he will he would like to do is to see an international law that really reflects the will and the interests of the, all the peoples. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, that was quite powerful indeed. And uh, uh, I'd like to now move on to the video messages that we've received. And uh, there are two after which um, we will invite uh, members from the audience to share their perspective if that, that happens to be the case. Um, I'm going to play this, and uh, uh, after this, we'll hear the second speaker. My name is Lucas Carlos Lima. I'm a professor of international law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, the university where Professor Dorcos and Santa Trindade obtained his law degree, an institution which he collaborated throughout his life. Every time Professor Santa Trindade came to his birthplace, Minas Gerais, he paid a visit to the Faculty of Law which is why he is loved and admired by all the colleagues in this institution. I'm also the editor of the Revista da Faculdade de Direito da UFMG, the Law School Review, a journal with which he collaborated frequently and which, in his own words, was his own brilliant journal. I also bring this morning the greetings of Professor Hermes Lucio Guerreiro, Dean of the Faculty of Law, who has, as speaking, expressed the official tribute of all 110 professors of the faculty, the professor of Gonzalo's Trinidad in memories and the condolences to his family. May he find comfort for this irrevocable national law. Unfortunately, due to previous schedule commitments, I was unable to participate at the same time with you in this important conference, but I could not fail to pay my sincere tribute to Professor Gonzalo Trinidad. So I am immensely grateful for the invitation uh, from the Chief of Society of International Law. Much appreciated invitation. I have no doubt that many of my colleagues who shed light on all professors Trinidad and Sadu Trinidad in spirit of talents, his magnetic charisma and his ability to produce significant academic works and operate international justice deserve all the reflection and will certainly be remembered and celebrated. I would like to share with you a personal story that reflects an important feature of Professor Gonzalo Trinidad's work, his unshakable belief in the causes he chooses to embrace. This is true to a number of topics regarding the humanization of international law, but it is especially true in relation to one of his last topics, the universal obligation of nuclear disarmament, one of his last books published in Brazil in 2017. Like many students who attended the Hague Academy of International Law during the professor's 
years as a judge, I continue to maintain close, close contact with various members of the professor. In 2015, 2016, I had the honor to be part of the Marshall Islands defense team before the International Court of Justice in the nuclear disarmament cases. After the reading of the 2016 judgment, in which the court ruled that he did not have jurisdiction to hear the case based on the alleged absence of the dispute, I met Professor Kutsabu Trinidad in his office at The Hague. He was wearing a black tie. Then he said to me, today is a day of mourning for international justice. Professor Kansado Trindade composed the large minority of the court that understood that the case should go ahead because the cause of the nuclear disarmament was one of the noble causes that deserved support within the proceedings before the World Court. Again, he would be a dissenter, but he did not care about that. For him, it was more important to put the ideas out of the box and think about an international law more equal, democratic, and safer. As you can read in his dissenting opinion, his perception of an international law without nuclear weapons was a cause worth fighting for. Since then, he, we would continue to talk about this and other topics. The professor followed as an observer the negotiation process of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also writing on the sun. The professor was tireless in his studies to fight his battles and defend his causes, and he nobly lent his pen to those causes. He fought with full force of his words, his legal culture, and his strong views of international law for his cause. As we know, until his last day, he was a fighter. In our last conversation, I made a point of making it very clear to him that as one of the professors of international law at his former faculty, I would continue to fight some battles that deserve to be fought. He seemed to appreciate that statement. I believe that an important source of inspiration that the professor leaves for all future generations of international lawyers that he managed to cultivate in Brazil and in the world is the importance of fighting the good fight, continuing the race, and keeping the faith. Certainly, Professor Gonzalo Trindade did it. Certainly, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, which tirelessly remembered one of his most brilliant students, the good fight will continue to be fought. Perhaps I can say here firsthand that the journal that he considered himself, the Journal of the Faculty of Law of WMG, one of the best ranked in Brazil and Latin America, will launch an special issue in his memory, and all those of you who wish to contribute are more than welcome. With this brief story and this brief reflection, I close by paying my most fond tribute to Professor Antonio Augusto Gonzalo Trinidad. He fought the good fight and inspired us to listen. We also have another address by another participant who couldn't join us but, but is also kind enough to share a recording of his address. I shall play this and then offer concluding remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you. And colleagues, today we, the sons or daughters of different distant lands, yet brothers and sisters of the same human family, today we unite to lament the passing of Professor Gunagus Casabrinaj and to pay homage to his legacy. The world has lost a humanist. The legal community lost one of its most distinguished voices. And I lost a dear friend. Professor Casabrinaj is from my hometown, Belo Horizonte. See, with a poetic link, Belo Horizonte is Brazilian Portuguese for a beautiful horizon. He was educated in an excellent uh, Catholic school. And he did his legal studies at the Federal University of Minas Gerais before moving to his master's and doctorate at the University of Cambridge. And I come from a similar background. I was also part of the Catholic educational system and a student of the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And it was there at our alma mater that I met Professor Kassandri Dutch in person for the first time. By that time, he was already a stellar figure in international law and human rights with Interalia, all the important record of inter-American rulings and transformations that we are familiar with. Despite his many international commitments, he would still visit our alma mater from time to time, especially to of his trajectory. 
He was always particularly kind, generous, and attentive vis-a-vis -vis students and young professionals. In our alma mater, the Student Association is very traditional and was an active actor in many historical events in the country. When I was finishing my first legal studies in my early 20s, the Student Association asked me to deliver a speech in honor of Professor Pensado Trinidad. It was the centennial of the Student Association, and the student leadership decided to give a medal of honor to Professor Pensado Trinidad, a medal that was named after José Carlos da Mata Machado, a former member of the Student Association who was tortured and killed for political reasons during the Brazilian dictatorship of 1964 to 1985. This event was a few months before the professor's inauguration in office as judge at the International Court of Justice. After I delivered the speech and the ceremony was over, he walked towards me and asked me to send him the text of the speech. He gave me his card and wrote his personal email down. Above all, he addressed me with respect and he treated me as an equal, despite the abysm of knowledge, experience, and recognition that exists between a one-of-a-kind master jurist and a student in his first years of legal studies. That would be the beginning of a dialogue that went throughout the years to my immense benefit. In the years to come, he would visit our city of Belo Horizonte and invite me for coffee. He religiously visited Belo Horizonte to be close to his father, who was then, I believe, a nonagenarian. I was not surprised to learn that the coherent humanist was an affectionate son. I referred to the professor's deference towards students moments ago, and here it's time to highlight another of his virtues on the personal level. He was a family man, a family man with an adorable family. During those meetings, mostly at Belo Horizonte, occasionally at the Netherlands and in Washington, D.C., he would share his news, and being who he is, these were frequently very exciting news of rulings, events, publications, international occurrences, and so on. His coexistence greatly expanded the horizon of my perception. He was proud of his achievements, and he had every right to be. Very few humans are blessed with comparable intelligence, work ethic, and an industrious capacity for work. But he had no ordinary pride, not at all. As you all know, he was decorated and honored by universities, governments, legal societies, etc., etc., etc. The man was also honored by the victims of human rights violations, families, communities. I will tell you this. During the conversations we had, never, never, ever he demonstrated more pride than when he spoke about when his work was acknowledged by the victims themselves and for their families and communities. This pride of humane endeavors is most admirable. Another interesting aspect of his personality was his good sense of humor and exquisite laugh. During one of, the, of our conversations, he told me once that in the International Court of Justice, there were certain language affinities. Some of the judges were English speakers, others were French speakers. And he was such a character. He told me laughing that he would intentionally change from English to French and the other way around, just to play with his colleagues, <laughs> that he would change from one language to the other many times. He certainly had an interesting mind. I also find this good sense of humor of his to be very consistent with his writings and thinking. He knew profoundly about the best and the worst in humanity. In his work, he dealt with human atrocities, mass killings, mass torture, and so on. He nonetheless kept his faith in humanistic values and the possibility for human improvement. Having a good sense of humor fits well with his faith in humanity. That joyful uh, language play of his with English and French among the ICJ judges was also a clever manifestation of his independence and autonomy. He was an independent thinker and jurist that paid due attention to the lessons of the great minds of the past. In 1944, the famous physicist Albert Einstein was asked if philosophy should be a part of the education of a physicist, and he responded, yes. Knowing the historical and philosophical context of physics, of science, gives us autonomy in the face of the prejudices that most scientists carry 
And this autonomy, wrote Einstein, is what marks the difference between the mere artisan or specialist and the one who effectively seeks the truth, end of quotation. The same reasoning applies to the law. International lawyers are among the professions that are called to manage human sufferings, conflicts, and displacements. There are certain insights on the layers of the human condition that can only be found in the great works of literature or philosophy. Professor Kassad Trindade remains a towering, towering example of how beneficial philosophy and the humanities in general can be for anyone who wants to know of the law in its profundities. I feel in my heart that he would have liked me to highlight this as also an aspect of his legacy. Many law students start their path by reading Lon, Lon Fuller's Case of the Spelunian Explorers, a tale of judgment during which each judge is the incarnation of a school of legal thought. Accordingly, there is a judge that incarnates positivism, there is a realist judge, there is a judge that incarnates the natural law tradition, and so on. Professor Casado Trindade was a self-declared adept of the natural law school. He believed that the law was not a man in itself, that the law, be it national or international, is or should be a means to a humane end to solve controversies peacefully, to zeal for humanity and to zeal for human dignity in the best possible way. In this, he represented, however, a small minority in the present legal profession. One of the fundamental insights of Fuller's classic case of these Malaysian explorers is that the law is not subject to a single mode of interpretation. If there are different modes of interpreting and applying the law to solve controversies, which one is the best? Which one should we prefer? For Cansado Trindade, the answer to this question was a, an easy one. We should go with the best in terms of being the most humane one, the one that is closer to the humanistic ends of peace and human dignity that the law fundamentally serves. One of the central ideas of Cansado Trindade's legal thinking was that beyond the formal legal sources, there was a material source, an ultimate legal source, human conscience. Curiously enough, sometimes I feel that in a way, a special and strong way, Cansado Trindade served as the human conscience of public international law. We are all very thankful for that. Dear friends and colleagues, today, we Um, we've now reached the end of our lecture in the memory of Justin Dade, but before we close, uh, as a small tribute to him, and as perhaps the youngest speaker, in fact, the moderator for this session, uh, as a deep realization of what the judge brought uh, and in his departure, what, what one can symbolize the realization of this global shift towards the recognition of human rights and his pursuit of liberation of perhaps the most vulnerable and oppressed of societies, namely the refugees, the minorities, the indigenous groups, and perhaps also the environment was characterized as a manifestation of the judicial, the global judicial conscience. One is particularly observant of his description of human rights violations and the transcendental scope of the traumatizing effect on individuals beyond recognition of time and also the detention of individuals and families, victims of forced disappearance or torture and the anguish which societies suffered because of this and the reconciliation of inter internal conflict by structures, government structures to bury the historical recognition of such crimes and atrocities. His studies provided the foundation for the creation of human rights law through the articulation of the right of truth, right to a life as a human project, and the categorization of non-discrimination as a use cogence norm, as well as the acknowledgement of the rights to persons for peace and development. Judge endorsed the objective of building a world devoted to disarmament and safeguard the common heritage of humanity.
he cautioned that they emphasized individual and the responsibility on such individuals should not be overshadowed, overshadowed by the equal, equally vital admission of responsibility of such crimes. Fundamentally, he believed in the mission of international justice, which should be provided on the basis of individual liberty towards the groups who face persecution and, in short, humanizing international law. If Judge was here today, perhaps he would say what we all can say in consonance, which is Slava Ukraina, to fight the name of human rights and to live and protect human rights. I thank everyone here who've taken out their precious time to remember someone who's, who's inspired them and motivated them at every rung of the ladder. I am also deeply thankful to my friends who have helped me organize this lecture and collect this galaxy of stars to form a constellation, which in unison says, thank you. I thank everyone who's taken out time. Thank you once again, and good evening. Thank you.